In this week's video, we'll be taking an unwanted and otherwise thrown away refrigerator magnet and making it into magnet stamps for a magnet drawing board. So my alma mater recently sent me this in the mail, this fridge magnet, to try to get me to give them money. And, you know, I just think this is incredibly crass. Uh, look at this thing. It's got a nice cute dog. It says, now more than ever. So, you know, at a time when we've got a huge crisis in America and the rest of the world, we've got millions of people facing joblessness and eviction, and they think I should give them money. This from an institution that recently got 2.7 billion, with a B, from DARPA to work on drone tech that Google doesn't even want to touch. They're not getting any of my money. You know, if, if you're getting similar stuff from your alma mater, I, I highly recommend find your local food bank or something that actually is going to help people in a more direct way. To say nothing of how expensive it is to mail something like this out. This is an actual magnet that got produced and mailed to me on a postcard. And I, don't even, I have no idea how much that costs. But upshot of that is I now have this magnet. It's not a particularly good magnet, but I'm going to put it to use. So my son has been into these magnet drawing pads lately. Uh, so they have like, I don't know exactly how it works, but it's basically enclosed iron filings and then you draw with a magnet. So you can draw, 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 and then erase and draw again. And my son's at an age, he's, he's 21 months and he's just starting to really enjoy scribbling and drawing, but he's not quite ready to be trusted with crayons or markers just yet. We tried crayons and we have marks all over our walls to, <laughs> as a result. So, so these have been really great. But usually they come with some stamps as well. So you get something that you can draw with and you get some, some stamps. This, this board we got at a Salvation Army, I think, for about three bucks. Totally money well spent, but it was missing the stamps. So this isn't much of a magnet, but it's just enough that if I press it down, we get a mark left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this up and 3D print some backing to give my son a variety of shapes. And we'll have sort of a uh, swords to plowshares kind of thing going here, where we take uh, a bit of propaganda for a military industrial complex and we make it into a toy for my son. So let's get started. So I started by making the shapes for the magnets. And the way I did that was to make a new document in Inkscape that was the same width and height as the actual magnet itself. From there, I decided that the magnets should be about 35 millimeters in diameter. That, that seemed like a good size. So what I did is I, I made some circles that were 35 millimeters by 35 millimeters. And I kind of filled the magnet shape with, with as many of those circles as I could get in. And once I had those, I made a new layer and then just started making some shapes. So I made some basic geometric shapes. And one thing I made use of was in the, the newest version of, of Inkscape has this really nice feature where you can fill it the points of a path. So with uh, path effects. So I made use of the path effects to get nice rounded points and yeah that gave me all all the pieces so I kind of filled in as many shapes as I could get into the, the area of the magnet and that gave me something I could print out on normal paper to serve as a template okay so I've printed out the template and the plan is is to take the magnet and what I'm gonna do is I, I need to get this onto the magnet so what I'm gonna do is use some masking tape which is nice and papery. And I'm gonna cover the magnet masking tape, and then I'm gonna use some white glue to affix the paper template that I made to the magnet via the masking tape. And what that'll let me do is I'll be able to cut out the shapes of the magnet to exactly the shapes that I want, and then just peel the tape off, and I'll have magnets in the shape that I need. So let's do that.
now it was time to actually make the 3D printable backings for the magnets. And to do that, I wanted it to match the 2D shapes that I printed out and cut from the magnets, but just a little bit bigger, and then extrude them out into 3D shapes. So I decided to start with SVGs and Inkscape. So I went back to Inkscape, and I copied all of the shapes that I had for the original template, and then I went one by one and just made them a little bit bigger so that they'd have a little bit of a gap to serve as a backing. And the reason I took this approach is that the newest version of OpenSCAD, so it used to be the case that I would use the, an add-on for Inkscape to export paths as, as OpenSCAD files, but now it's even nicer because the newest version of OpenSCAD can just import SVGs directly. So that's what I, I was planning on doing. I did have to do a little bit of work because as far as I can tell, there's no way to export just a selected shape as an SVG from Inkscape. Ultimately, SVGs are just text. So I opened it up in a text editor and I went and just copied each path into its own SVG file. One of the things I did have to do to make that work is I was careful to give each of the shapes that I wanted to eventually be a 3D printable object. I gave its own ID, the object properties in Inkscape, which made them easy to find when I looked at the actual markup. So even though it might seem like a lot of work, it actually wasn't that bad to just go through and find the path code in the base SVG that corresponded to each shape and copy paste that into its own separate SVG, giving me a bunch of individual files that I could bring in to OpenSCAD. So here you can see what I did at, once I had all the individual backs separated out into a file. So what I did is I had the all back sep that SVG imported into OpenSCAD. And then I just went one by one and cut content out of all back sep that SVG and pasted it into its own file. Then I, I wrapped that, I imported that into OpenSCAD added a linear extrude, and then wrap that in its own module. So as I went, things were disappearing from the all-back sep, which I, I was coloring bright red, and things were appearing as their own separate individual objects that I could then do more work on later. I also ended up applying a translate to bring each shape to roughly the center. I'd get this more precise in Blender later, but I wanted to just kind of rough it out and get them more or less centered to begin with. One of the really cool things about OpenSCAD is that you can write command line scripts to automate your process. So, okay, so here we are in a, a simple shell script. <laughs> if it doesn't look simple, it's uh, just because bash scripting isn't the, the most clear uh, context. Looks like there's a lot going on here, but let's just take it part by part. So the key thing that's happening here is OpenSCAD is getting called in the command line with an input of the stamp backs file, and then dash O for output into the subfolder backs, and then I'm saying back, I'm doing a little bit to grab a name out of here, .stl, and here's, so, so far what's, what's happening here is I'm just opening up a file, so invoking OpenSCAD with this input, and asking it to produce this output. And since this is an STL, that's all it needs to know to know that I want 3D output. Because you can also get 2D output, you can get animations, you can get still images, it's, it's very, very versatile. And then the other kind of cool thing that's going on here is this dash D part num equals part index. So uh, in order to really talk about that, we do have to cover that there's there's a for loop happening here, right? So there's nothing really magical here. It's just that we have this function defined in our script, export part, and we pass in a number to that. So when we run export part with this number, it, it'll range from zero to nine, and then within export part, we'll use that as part index. And we use that in two ways. We use it to index into this array of, you can see all, all the names, rectangle, triangle, hexagon, etc. And we use it in this dash D. So this dash D is really cool. So what it does is it's gonna pass in some value to the OpenSCAD script. So let's, let's go back to OpenSCAD. So here in OpenSCAD, we have this part num that's right at the top. This variable is gonna be passed in a value from zero to nine. And what that's gonna do is it's just gonna, it's gonna click through and export each one of these objects. So we have a separate module for each object. We have this other module that kind of acts as a big switch case statement, which unfortunately isn't something that's built into OpenSCAD. So I have to, it wounds me a little bit to use a bunch of nested else ifs, but that's what we have to do. And upshot of all of that, is something pretty cool and that I can just, yeah, so this part num, what this is really saying is this dash D part num is saying that find the part num value and set it to whatever we're passing in here, which in this case is 
a variable that corresponds to the first argument, to the export part function, which is going to range from 0 to 9. OK, so now that we've done all of that, you'll see that I've got this empty backs folder. And now all I have to do is run my export backs command, and it fills up. So now I have 10 STL files, one for each of the, the backs that I want. This probably seems like a really roundabout way to get there. But what's really nice is if, like, let's say I want to change the height that I extrude these at. All I have to do is make one change to the open SCAD file and then rerun the script. OK, so finally, something that's going to involve FreeCAD. So I, I have the, the shaped magnets, and I have the, the STLs for the backings, but I need some way for my son to actually hold these things. So I'm going to make a handle, and that should be pretty straightforward. So um, I'm going to import one of the exported backs just to have a, some reference here. So let's let's try the uh, hexagon. OK, so this gives me just something to kind of look at. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this new body, rename it to handle. And this is going to be pretty simple. I'm just going to go to the front here and start sketching. OK, so I think I'm pretty happy with this. It's I'm, I'm going to add some fillets in a minute. but. I just want a nice chunky handle. But you'll notice that now the, this misalignment is really obvious. So I'm going to fix that in Blender. Why Blender? Well, because I, I already have one more thing I want to do in Blender, so I might as well do it there. And I think it's actually just going to be easiest to kind of line this up by eye. I think that's going to be it for FreeCAD. OK, so here I am in Blender. And what my objective here is to just bevel these edges so they're nice and round. Since that's kind of a, a tricky thing to do in OpenSCAD, so I figured I'd just do it in Blender. This also gives me the benefit of being able to really get these things nicely aligned. So first thing I'll do is just go into edit mode, grab all the vertices. I'm going to switch to wireframe. And I'm just going to move it so that things are nicely centered. That looks pretty good. And the next thing I want to do is apply a bevel to these edges. I, I haven't had much luck coming up with a good way to do this. So what I've done that works pretty well and it's not too terrible is uh, is I'm just going to dissolve all of the edges in this top face. I'm guessing this is pretty painful to watch for people that I'm sure there's at least one Blender guru, guru out there seeing this and just wanting to scream at the sc screen and tell me a better way to do it. So if you if you are that person, please leave a comment and let me know how I could more easily do this. The issue is that you know there's no uh, nice quad based topology since this is just coming in as a bunch of triangles. So things that would normally work in Blender with like edge loops and whatnot uh, aren't really as applicable here. Okay, so done that. I've got that all all dissolved and it really didn't take that long. So now I can do this the nice thing of just going control clicking around to get all of the edges that I want. And now I'll just bevel. OK, so that's that's all good. Back to object mode. I'm just going to use a union to attach the handle to the stamp back. As there's no real need to have a hole here, I can just print it as one piece. It'll be stronger. It'll be a lot more robust. And it's just less to deal with, right? Less assembly time. There's our final version. So I'm going to export this out. and. That's it. So I'll just do that a bunch more times, and I'll, I'll have all the stamps ready to print. OK, so here we have the magnet with masking tape and the template glued on. I've let the glue dry thoroughly, and now I'm ready to actually cut it out. And this magnet, it's thin enough that I think I should be OK to just use normal scissors. So let's get started. OK, so now I have a bunch of little shaped magnets with paper on them. So next, I just need to peel the paper off. And then I'll be ready to actually assemble. So I have two printed so far, two of the backings printed so far. 
hexagon on the pentagon. Uh, pretty happy with how they came out. I think it's gonna work just great. I have some more printing, but while the other ones are printing up, I might as well go ahead and finish these off. Okay, so so far I'm still waiting for the, all the others to print, but I do have my pentagon and my hexagon ready to go. And I know for a fact that this pentagon is going to be involved in precisely zero drone strikes, so that's a bonus. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is just peel off the masking tape. So the nice thing about having had that masking tape on there, oh, <laughs> well, all the paper came off. I thought my original intention was that the, the masking tape would make it easier to get the paper off, but it looks like the paper just came off as it is. Well, I'm still gonna take the masking tape off because I don't really trust the masking tape bond to be permanent. So I think if I did glue the masking tape to my 3D printed part, it probably, I just don't trust that. Okay, so here's our little bit of magnet. Here's our stamp. And what I'm gonna do is just super glue them together. So let me get the hexagon ready to go as well. Okay, so that gives me my two magnet pieces for these two, and I just need to glue them on. So I'm just gonna smear that around a bit. I'm gonna use a little bit of paper just to make sure I spread that out so that the glue gets onto every, gets onto the edges of the magnet. Okay, it smells good and super gluey. So now I'm just gonna get this on, kind of rotate it a little bit and hold that for just a bit. And there we go. That's one nice shape magnet. So let's do the other. Okay, so there we go. That's two down, eight more to go. Okay, moment of truth time. I have a magnet board here from Daiso, which as you probably know is one of my favorite places. And I've got all the magnets ready, so let's test them out. Okay, so, that off. and let's try it. So I'll grab a square, and we get a square. Our pentagon gives us a pentagon. A circle gives us a circle. If I had a snozberry, it would give us a snozberry. But we've got plus, a little rectangle, a triangle. Hexagon. Star. And a couple of small circles, too. I think that counts as a, as a success. I'm really happy with how, how this came out. I have a nice little assortment of, of stamps for my son. I think I am probably gonna hold back on these two just because I think they're a little bit too small for him. But other than that, I think the others are gonna be ready to go. And uh, I'll, I'll have a link below to both the STLs for all these backings, uh, as well as the paper template I used to cut out the magnet shapes. Uh, it's probably pretty unlikely that you'll have a magnet that's exactly the same size, but you can print out the shapes, glue it to whatever unwanted refrigerator magnet you happen to have, and take it from there. And I'll also have a link below to help you find your local food bank, because uh, if you do have some extra funds, if you don't, I understand it's a rough time for everybody, but if you do, do have extra funds, please consider giving to something reputable that directly helps people, like a food bank, or some other reputable charity. Trust me, your college is gonna be fine. I know mine will. They're, they're certainly getting all the funds they need from DARPA. So uh, yeah, as always, thanks so much for watching. And if you like this kind of content, you wanna see more toy making and toy hacking videos, please don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe. Any of that helps the channel a lot and it really helps me to keep doing this. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Hope everybody's staying safe and I'll see you next time.